Okay, so shall we get started? Um, welcome everybody. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Ivor Simpson, who has just re well, fairly recently joined us from uh, UCL, joined in 2019, just in time to um, go home again. <laughs> um, and he's going to be talking to us today about using uh, probabilistic uh, modeling to improve uh, imaging. Um, and I'm excited to hear what he has to tell us. Over to you, Ivo. Very good. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the intro. Let me just get this started. Hopefully, you can still see everything. Uh, I can't see the chat, so do let me know if uh, you, uh, you know, anyone has any questions. Right. So yeah, the title of my talk today is uh, "Probabilistic Modeling and Machine Learning for Neuroimaging Analysis," and it's going to cover a few different things that I've done over the last. Uh, 10 years or so, but there was a bit of a gap and I'll explain in a bit. Um, so just to introduce myself, uh, I fairly recently joined the University of Sussex as a uh, lecturer in AI. So I'm based in the Department of Informatics. And uh, I did my DPhil at Oxford working in medical image analysis. So developing methodologies for looking at neuroimaging data. I'm going to talk a bit about some of the work I did there. And then I did a two year postdoc at uh, UCL working between the Dementia Research Center and the Center for Medical Image Computing. And most of that work was on uh, diffusion analysis and model fitting and uh, pipelines, but I'm not gonna be talking about that today. I actually spent the last uh, five and a bit years uh, working in an industrial research capacity for a small tech company. So I was working for a company called Anthropics Technology who make uh, augmented reality products and image editing products and various other things using machine learning applied to computer vision and graphics, which kind of gave me another different perspective. But I always wanted to come back to academia and an opportunity arose. Uh, to come to come to Sussex and uh, and so I'm really excited to be here and to meet you all because uh, I joined in January just in time for the pandemic so I didn't get a chance to meet a lot of people who work on um, on some of the topics of interest for me things like neuroimaging it's one of the main application areas I'm interested in as well as uh, more generally machine learning and uh, computer vision so the overview of my talk today is I'm going to tell you a bit about probabilistic models for morphometry. So how we can build uh, probabilistic models for understanding shape differences. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about two things which I did related to adapting the uh, hyperparameters for the, your data and quantifying and compensating for uncertainty. And then I'm going to briefly talk about a couple of things that I did in the last year or two related to using deep learning and computer vision. And these developments might be of interest to fixing some of the problems that we see in probabilistic modeling for neuroimaging. So, um, but I'll start by talking about brain morphometry. So morphometry is the measurement of shape and it's a way of, uh, measuring the different, it's mainly used in neuroimaging to measure the differences in shape between different populations. So voxel-based morphometry from uh, John Ashburner and Carl Friston at UCL is probably the most famous approach, which um, is a little bit more complicated than this, but it's basically a voxel-wise comparison of the gray matter probability. So you spatially normalize, which I'll explain what that means in a moment, some uh, you, you, your uh, gray matter segmentations, and you compare the amount of gray matter at different points in the brain between populations. And um, so that's one way of doing it. And it uses the idea of spatial normalization, which is where you take your uh, subject image here and you want to align it with an atlas. And the process of aligning the image uh, is means that every voxel in uh, your subject image now has a corresponding anatomical location in the atlas. And the point in of spatial normalization is that every voxel now corresponds to the same sort of anatomical feature. So if we take our subject and we spatially normalize it, then we should end up with something which looks quite similar to our uh, 
our atlas image. So this is a transformed version of the subject. Now, this by itself isn't particularly uh, useful, transforming the subject image to look like the atlas, but if you are transforming a gray matter probability map, then you're transforming the, the probability of there being gray matter at any pixel into the atlas space, uh, which is normalized by the um, change in volume. But you could also, this is useful for other things like functional MRI analysis and diffusion, I'm sure you've seen, many of you have seen this idea before. But one thing about these kinds of mappings is that they calculate a, a nonlinear deformation field, which is a geometric transformation which relates the atlas image with your subject image. And one way of understanding differences in shape is to look at the features of that deformation field. So what we see here is um, a subject image being registered to an atlas. And the image on the right is the Jacobian, uh, the determinant of the transformation Jacobian. And you don't need to know exactly what that means, except that it's a local measurement of the amount of expansion or contraction of the atlas to make it look like the subject image. And so what we see is that the, the shape differences measured just by changes in volume are there's an enlargement of the ventricles, which is so uh, the determinant of Jacobian, if it has a value of one, that means that the volume stays the same. If it has a value greater than one, then it's expanding or less than one, it's contracting. And so what we see here is that the ventricles are, are expanding, as you can clearly see from the image here and uh, bits of the gray matter in general contracting in order to relate these two images. So deformation-based morphometry is one way of uh, using these, uh, these uh, geometric mappings to measure differences in shape between populations. So what you could consider doing, what people have done is uh, to take a population of images and register them to an atlas and then build a classifier or calculate voxel-wise statistics to understand differences in shape between populations. But something else you can do with this is longitudinal uh, studies. So you can um, calculate between a baseline image of a subject and a follow-up image, maybe a couple of years later, you can calculate the localized changes in shape between the baseline and the follow-up image, which leads to another uh, determinant of Jacobian image here. And this corresponds to the local changes in volume uh, of this baseline image to transform it to the follow-up. And then you can spatially normalize these, um, these longitudinal changes uh, to give you uh, something which looks like this, which means you can now do population comparisons. So you take your uh, longitudinal change and you put it in the uh, Atlas coordinate frame. And uh, so then you can do uh, longitudinal uh, comparisons and see what the difference is between uh, populations. This is something which has been widely applied to uh, data sets like ADNI and OASIS and that kind of thing. And some of the features you might see, uh, so this is in the Atlas space showing the um, normalized changes over a single year. Uh, so this is the average for uh, subjects with, with Alzheimer's disease. So you can see the, the uh, typical expansion of the uh, ventricle areas, uh, loss of gray matter, particularly around the uh, hippocampus. And for healthy controls, you can see just a, a more general and much lower rate of change. So this is kind of what you, the kind of features that you might expect to see. And these are just the averages across the population, but obviously you can, there's, there'll be some heterogeneity there and uh, you can build nonlinear classifiers and things like that to, uh, to investigate this. And this kind of approach might be of interest for uh, determining the uh, efficacy of drug treatments and things like that, because you can compare the uh, changes that you see over a period with the uh, expected changes given their diagnosis. So the way we calculate these um, geometric mappings is a process called image registration or specifically nonlinear image registration, which is calculating a very flexible type of um, deformation to align the images together. And 
there's a lot of different algorithms and more recently a lot of machine learning models that have been proposed to address um, this this challenging task but it will always be um, a problem because the images are uh, are always going to be noisy and may contain artifacts and uh, biases from the scanner and things like that but more importantly there's no true dense correspondences to use as a means of validation or to infer or, or learn anything from we only have surrogate measures and kind of um, that we can use to try and evaluate how well any of these processes work and a lot of the image data is actually quite indiscriminate so for instance like uh, a lot of the the white matter doesn't contain any information which helps to drive this process and that can make it a bit more complicated it introduces a level of uncertainty so one way in which uh, one could seek to uh, address these issues is to take your uh, registration model and make it probabilistic and what I mean by that is we treat our model variables as random variables that follow a distribution. That is to say, our deformation field, we treat that as a random variable, which we are uh, inferring from some images. And the way we do this is to uh, write registration as a uh, generative forward model of the data, such that uh, we're trying to generate a target image Y as a transform version of a source image, which is what we already talked about when we, uh, in terms of aligning the images. And this transform, this transformation is parameterized by uh, some parameters W, which we're now going to treat as random variables. And that just means that they don't have a single value; they follow a distribution. In order to measure the how well we're explaining the data, we have this um, we have this uh, additive noise model here and what this does is um, we can use this as uh, to express our likelihood of having generated the data properly with some amount of um, expected error between our transformed image and the and the atlas and uh, the, the way we do this is we, we parameterize this as a as a uh, Gaussian noise uh, distribution but we are making the assumption that the noise is independent across voxels which we'll come back to a bit later on so something about this problem is uh, it because it's so ill posed there is no best solution we need to impose some prior information which is one reason why a probabilistic model makes sense and spatial regularization which forms part of any registration model can be thought of as prior knowledge for the deformation field so we have to express what we ex what kind of deformations we would want we would want to see and typically uh, we need to say make some statements about the magnitude or smoothness of the of, of the deformation field um, because we would expect uh, that any um, a voxel is not going to move all the way from one side of the brain to the other that wouldn't be a very useful mapping. And we would also expect the nearby voxels would move in similar ways. So uh, typical transformation priors might be uh, penalize the bending of the, um, uh, the bending of the deformation field or some kind of elastic energy. And it might be written something like this. So we say our, our prior on the deformation parameters is that it's a multivariate normal distribution with zero mean because a priori when we're doing any kind of registration we're not expecting to see any uh, uh, any uh, particular deformation we know there's going to be something it's um, but it's zero mean and uh, some linear operator which we call capital lambda this leaves us a, a free parameter lowercase lambda which controls the strength of our regularization so that's how strongly we're going to impose our prior knowledge. And to give you some intuition, when we um, specify a prior, what we're actually saying is we're saying what kind of deformations we expect to see. So um, this is an example of minimize of a bending prior. So these are the this is just a, a 2D slice 
through a 3D volume. So that's why it looks a little bit a little bit strange because there's some things coming in from in the, in the other plane. But um, so we're actually making we're expressing uh, some information about the kind of uh, transformations we would expect to see. And it's important to think about this because this introduces bias into any of our results. So regular revisation has a profound impact on any deformation-based morphometry features, or which also affects VBM as well. And as I, uh, as I mentioned, there's no ground truth for defining a good mapping. So these hyperparameters, uh, the regularization and whatever other hyperparameters are normally just defined by heuristics. You might have some data you evaluate on, but there's no guarantee that it generalizes to everything. You might have data which is different signal to noise ratio, or it might have artifacts, or um, we're also making statements about the magnitude of the uh, warp that we expect, the, uh, of the mapping that we expect to see. So to give an example of the differences you get from different uh, uh, values of lambda, if we take a source image and which we try and map to an atlas and we look at it with three different levels of regularization and these are the transformed images here we can see they generally look pretty similar uh, except the one with high regularization is, is slightly different at this point over here but if we examine the deformation fields we can see that if you have a low level of regularization the deformation field is very noisy you can't ascertain any particular patterns of change is uh, lots of kind of very uh, patchy, uh, bright and dark areas in indicating um, lots of expansion and contraction. And it's probably not learning anything, it's probably not inferring anything which is of interest. And so if you try to build a classification model using these kinds of result, these kinds of features, it's not gonna tell you very much. Uh, whereas if you use a high level of regularization, you end up with something which is very smooth. And it misses out on some local, some local features which are probably there and are interesting. So having a balancing act gives you um, more interesting features. So you can see some local contraction and expansion uh, and it's fairly smooth, but there are definite local patterns. So in order to do inference in these kinds of problems, we can fall back to Bayes rule, which I'm sure uh, everyone will have seen in some way, but uh, I'll go through the terms here and explain why, what they mean. Because what we're interested in is finding the posterior on our, uh, the posterior distribution of transformations, of the mappings between our subject image and the atlas or the longitudinal uh, pairs of images. And we're trying to find the ones which best explain the data. And the way we measure how well it explains the data is this likelihood term. Uh, which says how well does this transformed version of the source image explain the atlas? We also have a prior which is parameterized by lambda. This is which we've already talked about and There's this evidence term here and this evidence term is actually just a scalar and it says what is the probability of observing the data given the model and interestingly you can uh, learn you can infer how to improve your prior by looking at this evidence term. Because the larger the evidence, the tighter your prediction of your posterior, the kind of, the more confident you should be about the, the result that you get. So, um, and the evidence is calculated as, as the, um, uh, the integral of the likelihood term and, uh, and the prior where you, you integrate over the, uh, these parameters W. So it says, how likely are we to, uh, to have explained the data given um, our distribution over W? And this is typically intractable, but there are approximate ways of dealing with it, uh, such as variational Bayes, where we make some assumptions about the posterior distribution such that um, we have parametric distributions, such as multivariate normals and independence between parameter groups. And so what we would have in this case um, is uh, our, our posterior distribution on the transformation, the level of uh, noise in the image and the regularization 
um, given the data can be approximated by some form Q, which we then break into parts here. And this gives us a way of doing tractable, although it's quite ex computation expensive, for probabilistic inference, where we can remove these nuisance parameters, we can infer them from data. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail through the mathematics because I don't think it's, 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 it's relevant here, but I'd be happy to talk to anyone about it later if they were interested. So some of the results that we, we found is uh, this gives us better adaptivity to signal to noise ratio and uh, adaptivity to pre-processing. So um, FNER is the uh, FIMRIB nonlinear image registration toolkit, which um, my code was all built on top of. Uh, written by Jesper Anderson at FIMRIB. And um, uh, that had some level of pre-smoothing of the data. You could also not pre-smooth the data at all, so there's no pre-processing, or have um, a more moderate level. And uh, what we notice is that the value of lambda, the amount of regularization, as you would expect, goes down as the signal-to-noise ratio increases. So as you have, you can see more Clearly the image information, you need less regularization, but it doesn't go away entirely. But more interestingly, we find that there's, um, if you look at a whole population of, uh, of, of subjects, which you register to an atlas, there is a lot of variability in the optimal level of lambda for each subject. And that's because each subject will need a different amount of um, flexibility in this, in to describe the geometric mapping between them and an atlas. There's no reason to expect uh, someone with, out, with uh, severe Alzheimer's disease who's already experienced a lot of neurodegeneration will need a similar sort of transformation complexity to someone who's very close to the template already. And um, if you uh, allow more flexibility, then you end up uh, allowing more noise in some of the images than others. And so what I'm showing here is for different levels of the um, multi-scale optimization. So we kind of solve the registration problem at different spatial scales. And each of these plots shows a different spatial scale. And the red line is interestingly, this is the value that Jesper, the guy who wrote the tool, this is the value that he chose, just he handpicked it, it was a heuristic. And in almost every case, somehow, it pretty much matches the mean of the, uh, of the inferred values. So um, he made a really good heuristic choice somehow, it matches uh, what, falls out of the, uh, what falls out of the model when we just infer it using um, Bayesian statistics. And um, this uh, hyperparameter is particularly important for, doing lo for looking at longitudinal data. So if you use a set of parameters designed for um, looking at cross-sectional data, then you'll end up with a very noisy uh, map of the uh, localized changes over time. Whereas, um, so uh, these hyperparameters are really important to, to tune and tweak. And we also found a, a difference in lambda between different subject populations. So um, for uh, subjects with Alzheimer's disease in general, it preferred to have a lower value of, uh, of lambda, less spatial regularization, because it needed to do more changes. There are more changes happening over time than in healthy controls. Uh, and another, uh, another thing is that in all of these uh, types of approaches, a limitation is that we uh, assume there's a global deformation prior. There's one prior which explains uh, everything uh, across the whole image which means we're expecting the same amount of change everywhere. So um, I did some work on inferring more localized priors. And this was quite, uh, quite interesting. And I'm just showing a toy example here. I've got some real examples in the paper, but this is a bit easier to explain what's going on. But um, what, in this toy example, I'm trying to uh, calculate the geometric mapping between this reference circle with a bit of noise and this floating image here. And as you can see, there's just a contraction of this edge of the, of the circle coming in like this. And what we find is with the proposed prior, it gives you much more localized changes. So it's just giving us the contraction uh, of this area and the expansion of the background. Whereas with the more traditional priors, which have a global effect, 
it sort of spreads the it spreads this uh, contraction across the whole of the uh, across the whole of the circle, and um, it's not clear which is more biologically plausible because these geometric mappings aren't a real thing that we can measure. They're just a useful uh, kind of tool for for examining and and thinking about these things. But I would. Uh, I would imagine that a more localized change could be more relevant for some for some cases. So uh, we end up with something which is still smooth, but is is much sparser. And it also gives you a, a very different view of uncertainty because the way this um, spatially varying prior works is it only turns on only lets you move um, parts of the image where there's strong evidence to suggest it. Everywhere else, it just kind of turns it off. It says. You, you know, don't don't try and align bits of noise here because there's there, there's no utility to that. It doesn't um, it doesn't lead to an increase in the uh, explanation of the data? Something which I've already mentioned is the idea that there isn't a true geometric mapping between images. So the idea of spatial normalization, where you take a subject and you map it to an atlas. Um, and there's just one mapping which explains it, uh, doesn't really make sense. Instead, it's more of a distribution, a set of possible mappings. And a lot of these mappings might explain the data uh, um, almost identically. So it might have the same kind of pixel colors um, for different transformations. So you need other ways of being able to tell them apart because they, they appear to be equivalent. And one way of, uh, of estimating uncertainty is using the framework I've already talked about, where uh, with variational Bayes, it gives us approximate distributions on our sets of parameters. So we have a distribution over the set of mappings where we have a, a mean, which is our most likely mapping, but we also have a covariance matrix, which describes a smooth set of um, of uh, deformations that we could sample from or use in some other way. And something which is uh, important to note is that the uncertainty of this set of mappings is always going to be dependent on the prior. It just falls out of Bayes' rule. Your posterior is a, uh, is, is a product of your, your likelihood in your prior term. So the prior will always be part of that. So if you had no regularization, then in, um, in areas which had similar uh, pixel value, like in the white matter, you would have huge uncertainty. Any, uh, any point in any voxel in the white matter could map to any other voxel in the white matter, which wouldn't really make uh, a lot of sense. So a reasonable selection of the prior is important to uh, quantify uncertainty. So I'm not gonna talk about this in detail, but one approach we came up with for dealing with this was to um, uh, create these local smoothing kernels. And this is based on the uh, inferred uncertainty. But we can use this when we, for, when we spatially normalize features. For instance, uh, your um, longitudinal um, deformation-based morphometry maps. When you spatially normalize them, typically uh, before doing any uh, statistical analysis, uh, you might smooth you might smooth the data out a little bit using some fixed Gaussian kernel. And uh, what we did here was uh, the smoothing was uh, derived from the data and how uncertain it was about the location, uh, the the accuracy of the mapping. And this led to uh, a sort of incremental improvement in uh, classification accuracy and um, we used it for segmentation uh, but it, it was more sort of uh, theoretically interesting. Uh, another thing that we looked at doing was being able to sample uh, possible registrations. So uh, this is um, or sampling uh, probable uh, mappings between images. So if again this is like a uh, a set of prior um trans mappings that you might have so before you've seen any data 
uh, there's obviously a wide variety of of um, of potential mappings given but under the prior but when it's actually um, when you've inferred your posterior distribution you get something which is much uh, much more consistent and each of the possible alignments looks kind of plausible I should have shown the uh, atlas image here for for reference but um, so we can look at you just sampling these different mappings and using those features. So oh, uh, one way uh, we looked at doing this was to uh, calculate either uh, deformation-based morphometry features, I called them TBM, which is tensor-based morphometry. It's the same, same idea. It's just looking at the uh, determinant, the Jacobian maps, uh, or gray matter VBM, where for each subject, we calculate a mean feature, which is uh, either the determinant of the Jacobian map or the, the uh, uh, normalized grayscale map, but we also have a covariance matrix associated with each subject. So we're saying each subject has a distribution of possible features, which you could plug into a classifier or, or, um, or whatever kind of analysis framework you're going to use down the line. And the way we we used this was uh, we created an ensemble learning uh, approach where we created a set of classifiers based on samples of these features. So what that means is for each subject, um, we have this distribution. And for the um, what I'm showing here on the left is a set of possible classifiers that we could generate by drawing different samples of our um, of our training subjects, so um, taking into account the uncertainty, we can build a set of classifiers which each have slightly different means of separating the data. And you can also use the same approach at test time, uh, where you can use um, generate several samples of each of your test images before you do classification. This gives you a more robust idea of the uncertainty of your classification as well. So uh, we again ran this on a subset of ADNI data and we got a slight bump in uh, classification accuracy. And, uh, but one of the things about this was we could only run it on very small regions of interest. So we were just looking in the area surrounding the, uh, the hippocampus because um, it's very computationally expensive. Uh, this process of drawing samples. Which brings me on to like some of the issues with the, the work I've talked about so far, because this variational Bayesian approach, which seems to offer a lot, is quite computationally complex, which uh, makes it harder for it to have a uh, wider impact and be used in, in more, more broadly. And this is particularly true when using the spatially adaptive priors. So for each registration, it might take something like uh, five or six hours um, before. So that's a limitation of that, of, of that work at the moment. But I'm gonna talk a bit more about some ideas based on more recent work from deep learning, which might assist in improving that. Another thing I mentioned was the uh, idea that our probabilistic model says that the errors that we make at each pixel or at each voxel are spatially independent. And that is, uh, is clearly not realistic, as I'll demonstrate in a moment. Finally, one of the things that seems slightly strange about uh, deformation-based morphometry is that we're always measuring the differences between subjects and a template image, rather than measuring the, difference, the, the shape differences between subjects and uh, a particular population like a disease population or something like that so um, um maybe there's another way of without having to do our com we don't have to generate our features via the uh, template image and i'll talk about an idea for that in a moment let me just check how i'm doing for time all right so addressing the uh likelihood term so one thing which is uh, demonstrably clear is that the residuals in the um, in the model aren't independent across space. 
And by residuals, I mean the difference between the image that we're trying to predict, say the atlas image, and our transformed source image. And this uh, picture here shows the uh, difference between, it just shows the subtraction of those two images. And if the, uh, the differences were independent in space, then you should just see a sort of grainy, sort of um, salt and pepper looking um, picture here. Because, uh, but what we see instead is that the errors are clustered. They're uh, grouped together because the mistakes it's made is it's just misaligned like a, a whole area of the, of the image. It's clearly not spatially independent. And that's because the errors are actually depending on the local image content, which is in itself smooth. So there's no reason to presume that we could, we could have independent errors. And this is actually quite problematic because this approximation leads us to overcount our mistakes. So instead of saying, I've made, uh, for instance, in, uh, in this area here, instead of saying, I've made one mistake and it's spread out over several voxels, we instead say, I've made several independent mistakes. So, uh, which leads us to miscalibrate our level of uncertainty, but also affects our inference of things like adaptive hyperparameters. And uh, mathematically, it just seems like uh, it, it's, it's an approximation which is clearly erroneous. So I'm not, again, I'm not gonna go into much of the details on this, um, but I'm happy to talk about it with, with others offline if they're interested. But something um, we did with uh, a couple of years ago for CVPR with a PhD student who I was working with while I was at uh, Anthropics was um, we built a deep neural network called, uh, which is something called a variational autoencoder model, which uh, it's a bit like, it's a bit like a neural network version of PCA. It gives you a way of encoding an image as a set of uh, latent variables and then decoding the image back to reconstruct it. And um, previous work using, using these types of models had always assumed similarly to what we, we've been doing here in that the error each pixel is spatially independent. It's not, uh, the errors you make aren't related to the errors you make at the pixel next to you. And what we did was uh, uh, train a model where we could um, very efficiently predict structure in the noise. We could predict, I've made a mistake at this pixel, therefore I've made a mistake at this pixel and understand that and build a covariance matrix. So what we see here is, as well as predicting a mean um, when decoding an image, we also predicted a, um, a inverse covariance matrix which can be sparse, but the covariance is, is full rank. I'll explain what that means with this picture. So with, a, with our uh, variation autoencoder, um, we're using it to understand and build a kind of compressed model of images. So this is our, um, our prediction of a particular image X. We predict it as mu. And the real differences between the, uh, our prediction and the true image look like this. Now, if we just assumed our Gaussian model of error, this is what we are saying our differences look like. And this is the same for the case in uh, our registration model. We're saying that we expect all of our errors to be spatially independent and we end up with something which looks very sort of salt and peppery and doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and what we, what we managed to show is that we can draw a sample from our structured noise model and it understands that, there, that if, it makes, if it's made an error then uh, in the hair, then it's probably gonna be a long straight line. And so it can kind of add those kind of textures. But what we've demonstrated is that we can understand the structure in the noise. And this could be quite beneficial going back. Ooh to um, morphometry, um, we could incorporate this kind of idea 
as well as some of the other ideas which have come out of deep learning recently. Because um, machine learning has gone past the idea of uh, just working with black boxes and looking, treating deep learning as classifiers. There's a lot more that we can think about taking from that and applying to things like uh, neuroimaging or building models to analyze data and inverse problems. So um, one of the things that um, uh, has been developed is this idea of amortized probabilistic inference. And what that means is you train a function like a neural network and it will do the same job as uh, the uh, VB model, which I talked about earlier. It uses the same mathematics to optimize it. It just doesn't use but it uses the same objective, but it doesn't use the same uh, linear algebra procedure, which ends up being expensive and computationally complex. It just, uh, you train something to approximate uh, that same result. So that might make things much faster and more amenable to being uh, widely used, as well as being able to infer the structured noise and the adaptive regularization and uh, as well as the, uh, the actual parameters we're interested in. So that's one thing which I'm looking at moving into exploring. Another thing which uh, has come out of uh, recent work in computer vision and deep learning is the idea of learning differences uh, between populations of images. So some of you might have come across the idea of uh, this class of models called generative adversarial networks. And what they are is, is, is quite an interesting uh, idea is that they try and generate some data uh, from which, which is from a distribution. And then you train a classifier to say whether uh, the generated thing looks like a, a real sample from the distribution or not. And uh, a few years ago uh, at CVPR 2017, this was demonstrated for uh, what they called unpaired image to image translation. That is, you give it a set of images, one set in this case contained horses, and the other set contained zebras, and it learned what were the things in the images which made it an image containing a horse or an image containing a zebra. And it learned a model here, which takes this horse image, you put it through this box, and it now looks like a zebra, but the rest of the image is, should be mostly untouched. And then it then classifies it is whether this looks like a real image of a zebra or not. And that's how the, that's how the cost function works. And similarly, you can take zebras and map them to horses. So it's learning that what are the key differences between images just from bags of, bags of pictures? Like how, how can we tell the difference between these things? And, um, there's no requirement on there being paired data. So you don't need to have a horse that you've then colored in and turned into a zebra because it uses this idea of a cycle consistency loss. That is, if you take a horse and turn it into a zebra, you should be able to turn it back into the same horse by running the inverse um, transformation. So something we had at CVPR this year was taking a similar type of model, but applying it to, uh, but instead of it being, this function here, um, taking these sets of pixels and generating a set of pixels, um, our generator, our function which makes the change to the image, now predicts a warp field. So uh, the, uh, we take the image and the change you wanna make to it. So for instance, if it's a person, you might wanna make them smile or frown and uh, it will produce a warp field, which we then apply to the image. And then you then classify it as, does this image, uh, is it um, smiling or, and uh, does it look like a real picture? And what this enabled was for us to do very high resolution edits of images. So this is, um, we worked with this uh, very uh, complicated birds data set where uh, there's not a lot of examples and all the birds are in different poses and they're articulated. And there's labels like, uh, is the beak larger than the head or smaller than the head? And so we managed to train a model which could uh, apply these edits at very high resolution by learning how to do warps, as well as like uh, here, one of the edits was to make someone smile, but it could 
because we were dealing with wart fields, it was um, uh, very easy to scale these things uh, in terms of resolution and apply them in different ways. And it was also, um, there was a much uh, less of a burden in terms of data. So previous work on, on this, this data set hadn't managed to do anything which looked sensible. But because we were constraining it in terms of it had to be a warp, it had to be uh, inverse consistent, um, we managed to get some interesting results. Now, linking this back to morphometry, this is another thing which I'm working on at the moment, is how we could learn to map a subject to match an implicit population distribution as described by AGAN. So this is like the idea of when we were taking um, uh, horses and trying to make them into zebras. Here we're taking a brain of someone and we're trying to learn what's the geometric mapping which turns this subject image such that it looks like someone with Alzheimer's disease or someone with uh, whichever condition and um, then trying to analyze that set of possible mappings um, uh, in, 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 an, in an atlas space rather than just comparing the differences between uh, subjects and atlases. Um, so uh, that's, I'm just about sort of uh, wrapping up. Yeah, that's about right. Um, and I just want to tell you about some of the other things that I'm uh, kind of working on and, and interested in. So uh, during my postdoc, I, I work quite a bit on uh, diffusion MRI. I'm also doing uh, a couple of projects with Mara on uh, quantitative MRI. And uh, I'm generally interested in things like model fitting and data pr processing and understanding uncertainty and fitting models to data. Other things are more related to computer vision and using uncertainty for things like in uh, auto autonomous driving for um, making better decision making. So understanding the uncertainty of the, your estimates of depth or what you can see in front of you uh, are now very important being able to do that quickly and uh, calibrate that such that it's uh, meaningful. And uh, some of the other projects are more related to understanding uh, visual concepts with minimal supervision. So this idea of the variational autoencoder was to try and uh, explain images using, uh, similar to PCA, you explain images with uh, a few uh, latent variables, but we can try and make those latent variables uh, semantically meaningful. And so that's something I'm very interested in learning. So that could be uh, disentangling differences in lighting and color, for example, uh, from from no uh, ground truth supervision, as well. As, and finally, I'm also interested in kind of general image synthesis and understanding uh, image formation processes. So uh, just to wrap up uh, my talk, so hopefully I've conveyed that image registration is, is plays a key role in neuroimaging analysis. And it's not, uh, some people think it's a solved task, I guess, from a, a, from a, a user standpoint, perhaps you, you might be able to think of it in that way, but there's still some more things to, to think about. It's also the fundamental tool in deformation-based morphometry. And the uh, hyperparameter choices you make can cause a lot of, uh, can cause quite variable results. And uh, I've shown that variational Bayesian inference or Bayesian inference can let us adapt these parameters to your data. It also gives us a way of understanding uncertainty. So um, uh, as there is no true uh, geometric mapping between images. And finally, uh, deep learning methods do offer us a lot of um, new tools and ideas that might be good to address some of the uh, issues and challenges that we uh, that we, we might have in uh, analyzing our data. Uh, just some brief acknowledgements. My uh, PhD supervisors, uh, Julia Schnabel, who's now at King's, and uh, Mark Warwich, and uh, Jesper Anderson from uh, FEMRIB, who uh, helped me quite a lot with, the, with uh, being able to use his, some of his code. Uh, and while I was at UCL, I worked with Seb Orsalon, uh, Mark Moda, and George Cardoso, who are all now at King's as well, and also Nick Fox from the DRC and uh, my colleagues from Anthropics and uh, my PhD student from Bath, Garroway, who finished last year, and uh, Neil Campbell, who I work with on some of the uh, uncertainty estimation things. Uh, thanks for listening.
Thank you very much, Ivor. Um, are there any questions? I can see there's a couple of questions in the chat um, from Sam. Maybe Sam would like to ask his question, but if anyone else has any, please um, do chime in. You are muted, Sam. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for this. It was a really great talk. Um, uh, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, one that's kind of uh, only marginally related to what you talked about, but oh, my camera has gone off, but I won't worry about that. Um, so the first question was, you mentioned that, you know, you can use the determinant of the Jacobian in like a region to infer the amount of uh, stretching or squishing in that area. Uh, so like, you know, whether a region of brain is, is uh, under dense or over dense. Um, but I wondered whether you can actually use the derivatives in the Jacobian themselves. If you have like a very specific hypothesis, um, like maybe there's, if there is no, uh, some people miss a gyrus in some regions of the brain, can you use the Jacobians themselves to kind of more, uh, to make an inference that, oh, that gyrus is missing in this individual? Has anyone ever tried that even? Yeah, that's an interesting point. And uh, there was some work on um, something similar to that called, I think it was called directional tensor-based morphometry. Mm -hmm. So it was looking at specific directions. So rather than just looking at local expansion, it was looking at did things move in a particular direction. And uh, so, uh, but I, I don't know how well uh, kind of examined that kind of idea is, but it definitely sounds like something which is, is, a, is a reasonable hypothesis to to test and you can you could test using these types of models cool uh, and i just had another question about uh, the use of uh, these generative uh, uh, um, generative adversarial networks i always find it difficult to say that word um gans in order to warp brain data do you have to constrain the 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 the, the network in some way to learn smoothly like learn uh, uh, that a, a mapping has to be spatially smooth, or does it just do it for you? Does the, the does the discriminator in the network just learn that the images it has to it produces have have to be spatially smooth, or, or do you need to build that restriction in? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, I haven't had a chance to try this on on, on brain data yet. So, um, and I would imagine you'll probably need to build in some amount of spatial smoothness because there are so many different uh, potential ways you could you could generate a geometric mapping which would give you an image which looks very similar and looks like a real image yeah. so um, there was a really interesting um, paper uh, it was about I don't know, eight years ago called the completely useless registration tool <laughs> where I can they, imagine <laughs> where they they just sorted all the pixel intensities right and um, and so your mapping was just any voxel can move to any other space in the brain. Yeah, yeah. The best picture, and it was it was very funny because it, it highlights a lot of the issues that uh, some people in, in the field have found. But uh -huh. yeah, cool. Uh, it was a really interesting talk. Thanks very much. Thanks. Mara has a question. Hi, Ivor. Thank you so much for your talk. This might be a bit of a weird question, but I was thinking, do you think that any of these approaches could be useful for structures, I mean, others than the brain, where I'm thinking particularly, at the moment, I'm thinking particularly of something like the spinal cord, where you have very little anatomical sort of landmarks, and it's really difficult to get standard registration algorithms to work. Yeah, that's good. That, that's a good point. Uh, yes, I think it, uh, I think it could be quite interesting for for things like that. It, um, so I, I collaborate with um, a guy called Matthias Heinrich at, at Lubeck, who works on similar ideas for the lungs, which also have very few kind of anatomical landmarks, and um, trying to to I guess quantifying different things. But yeah, it, it does seem like the kind of uh, something which might be relevant to try in that kind of area. All right, thank you. Maybe we can talk about it offline. Charlotte has a question. Hi Ivor, uh, it's, it's really fabulous that you've joined us at Sussex. So um, a lot of what you said has got me thinking again about smoothing uh, and the reasons that we smooth. So my background is, is more fMRI uh, than structural, but we, we, we smooth uh, both, both these kinds of types of data. Um, 
And uh, I, I was quite struck by your suggestion that, you know, you could potentially alter the size of a smoothing kernel according to how uncertain the registration has been. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on a new method that's been proposed by the Human Connectome Project, um, that, uh, for, for fMRI anyway, um, such that we don't normalise at, at the second level when we're bringing all our participants together and ins instead try and conduct our fMRI statistics in native subject space um, by instead looking at where aerial borders lie according to these multimodal parcellations that they've come up with. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on smoothing. Do you like it as a pre-processing approach for dealing with uncertainty? Because I, I feel like it's kind of, you know, it's been a useful catch-all step for us to deal with uncertainty in prior pre-processing steps, whether it's uh, spatial or fMRI. Um, this new HCP approach is, is not necessarily going to be for everyone. It's going to be really expensive because you have to acquire this T2 and resting state. Um, but ha having seen some of the data that the HCP team came out with on uh, what you're losing when you smooth fMRI, it's, it's just really got me thinking about smoothing. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, so um, smoothing is, uh, it always feels like a bit of a hack, doesn't it? Because it's uh, so the, the, there's a couple of reasons why, uh, why we smooth is uh, one is that it, um, using smoothing the data, especially using a Gaussian kernel, makes your data more normally distributed, which makes it nicer for the for the stats. But it also compensates for yeah, this this uh, uncertainty in the alignment. Uh, I hadn't seen this this, this thing from the from the HCP. It sounds it sounds interesting. I mean, it, I, I guess you are always going to lose some of that fine grained detail when you smooth things out, and uh, particularly if you smooth things out using like a, a, a big wide spherical um, uh, Gaussian where it goes across the borders of structures. So yeah, I, I, perhaps using some kind of so, something like what, what I previously proposed or something else, which is sort of uh, more anatomically aware to do your smoothing and uh, which you could also, which, which you could combine. So it will give you something similar to, I guess, what they're doing with the ATP if you just moved within a, a region. So you kind of, um, yeah, use like a free surfer parcellation or something like that to, yeah, um, the, the uh, free surface style parcellations is is one of the steps that's built into this pipeline. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I can see how that I, I can see how that might uh, might give you similar effects. Um, but yeah, I'd need to think think a bit more about it. Yeah, it's. Uh, um, I I think with um, I think depending on what what you're doing, if it, it feels like the being able to sample to get rid of uncertainty seems like a nicer way of, of dealing with it. So you, cause then you're not really blurring things out. You're sort of saying, well, here's a possible thing way we could have done it. Um, but uh, that, that I get, I'm not sure how that will really work for fMRI compared. It works for things like VBM and TBM, but I'm not really sure what you'd end up with each subject having, you know, 10 possible fMRI normal or, you know, however many possible normalized, spatially normalized uh, fMRI patterns that you analyze. Um, I guess there's no reason why not to do that though. <laughs> uh, Ting has a follow-up question. Uh, yes, so um, because Charles, uh, you also brought up the uh, transformation to surface space. And one of my concern is when you are doing surface space transformation, you are doing a nonlinear mapping from the, um, the, the data you collected and processed in the sensor space to the surface space. Will that just potentially distort any kinds of the good, um, good correction that you are doing with the structural data over here? Um, to, um, so is this part of the HCP? pipeline no it's like this is just general um any kinds of um structural data when you are mapping your structural data to a surface space that's not specific to hcp it's just a free server thing yeah yeah um i mean the, the, i think there's there's been a lot of different ways of trying to to, to get a good way of mapping from uh, a volume to a, a surface i guess it's not that well defined what it 
what it really means because you're projecting like you know the surface of a frame of all its folds onto a sphere somehow so you're always going to lose you're, you're always going to lose something in that in that process you're going to lose some subtleties but um yeah i haven't i haven't been uh, i've uh, i'm just making my way back into uh, into neuroimaging so i haven't been following what the free surfer guys have been doing for the last uh, last few years so um i, I can't i can tell you too much <laughs> it's okay yeah um another thing about the imaging data so there are people um working on imaging data parcelation using a bayesian approach so they will have like a group model and then mm -hmm they will propagate that to each individual and you can have like different granularity of parcellation and even for different kinds of parcellation. So this is mostly work from uh, Ruby Kong. Um, she works in, uh, uh, in national, uh, the National University of Singapore, I believe. Yeah, but University of Singapore. So yeah, there are some other work in the functional domain as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I guess there's lots of ways you could try and um, do things, uh, try and do s smarter ways of doing parcellation based on uh, functional activations. There was also, there's a very, there was some interesting work on trying to uh, do spatial alignment based on functional activations where I think they got them to watch uh, this paper out of uh, uh, MGH maybe. They, they got them to watch uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and they, because uh, it's all time synced, and then they did the alignment based on uh, assuming they had similar activations or they had similar opinions about what was going on in the film. Um, so yeah, I guess there's lots of interesting ways you could try and uh, get a better handle on um, on uh, parcellations and how, how how structures are linked. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivo, and everybody else for the uh, interesting discussion. Um, I think we should wrap up there. Um, and yes, uh, before before we go, I'd just like to say that next week we have uh, another faculty presentation from uh, Matt Plummer, um, and this is and the title is "Retrieval Induced Updating of Face Memories: Behavioral and Electrophysiological, Electrophysiological Evidence." So that should be interesting. Uh, so thank you again, Ivo, and thank you, thank you, everybody else. Thank you, and not nice to virtually meet people. <laughs> See you, everybody. Um,